What's going on everybody? Welcome to Lift As We Climb, an unscripted online video show meant to empower people of color to start and grow their own businesses. I'm your host, Mike Stedman, and similar to last week, I'm gonna consider this a bonus episode because I know we're, this platform was built for entrepreneurship, but for whatever reason, over the last couple weeks, I've had some uh, amazing guests come visit me, uh, friends of mine that have just been privileged enough to go to some of the best schools in the country and so I just have to take this opportunity to get them on the camera to kind of share their stories. Before we do that I want to give a special shout out to our sponsor uh, Dope Coffee. Dope Coffee is a line that's getting dropped here soon so be on the lookout for that. Appreciate them sponsoring this platform. So with that said let's get it right into it. I'm ready man let's do it. I want to welcome Philip Jones aka Young Socrates my <laughs> frat brother aka Marine Corps Captain AKA Harvard Business School uh, candidate, right? Just finished his first. Go ahead and. Uh... Hey everyone, uh, Philip Jones. Mike and I go back about about a decade or so. Uh, just finished up my first year at Harvard's uh, Kennedy School of Government. Looking forward to starting my MBA in the fall and uh, seeing uh, where those two degrees take me. So it's, it's crazy, right? Because, you know, last week we had Marcus Johnson on here. Good friend, then, good friend of mine. Good friend of ours. Like I said, my tribe, you know, top five. Yeah. And now this week I'm blessed to have Philip Jones on here. Yeah. Um, Harvard Business School, man, especially as an African-American male. Yeah. Um, dude, just, just, that's, that's powerful. I don't know, you know, last week we talked about how, you know, when I was going to the Naval Academy, you know, I didn't have any African-Americans to look up to at that time. Yeah. First time I saw a black midshipman was when I was at the prep school. Yeah. And, you know, because of people like yourself, you got me to think about places like the Harvards and the Wards and the Georgetowns. And it just so happened that these are the best schools in the country, man. And so it's super, I'm super proud to know you. And especially- The honor, the honor is definitely mine. Um, you know, to be able to just pick up the phone and call people that are at these institutions, yep. man, that's, that's just amazing because, you know, these are places that people are coming from all over the world to go to school to. And when people tell me about these places, I'm like, oh yeah, you know, my boy goes to school there. And, uh, yeah, man, it's, it's, we need more of that. Like, I think, you know, me and you talk a lot about a lot of different stuff, uh, whether it's politics, whether it's business, yeah. whether it's uh, how to improve the lives of people of color. Um, but one of the reasons I brought you on here is because, you know, I think it's very important for us to be seen, yeah. which is one of the reasons I do the visual video as opposed to just uh, straight audio yeah. podcast. But I also want to hear your thoughts about, you know, how do people like ourselves that go to places, whether it's Naval Academy, mm -hmm. whether it's Harvard mm -hmm. or Warden, how do we take the knowledge, skills, and resources we're learning at these institutions to improve the lives of people of color, whether it's in the inner city, whether it's in the boroughs? Um, yeah. I'm just curious to hear your thoughts around that. That's uh, First of all, thank you, Mike, for having me on the show. Um, that is a very complicated question, um, but I'll try to break it down in a few different segments. Uh, the first thing, as you know, is my dad's a pastor and I'm always going to be my father's son. And something that he always said when I was young that really echoes throughout uh, my life, especially now that I'm in this different space, um, to whom much is given, much will be expected and required. And that's how I try to live my life. Uh, I was fortunate, um, Naval Academy and Marine Corps now at, at this great school. Um, but instead of just making uh, rich people uh, more wealthy and more uh, affluent. I think I want to use uh, these powers for, for good and to to give voice to people who are at the bottom of the pyramid, who are disenfranchised, uh, who have a voice but it's not very loud. I want to amplify that voice for them. I like it. You know, one thing. Um, so me and me and I call him Pip. So I'm just calling Pip on the podcast. <laughs> but, uh, so me and Pip go way back. Like we you said, we met at the Naval Academy. We he was actually in my squad, so I was in charge of him for a little bit of time. Then we went on to um, just become good friends in college, part of the same fraternity. Yeah. We both go Marine Corps, yeah. both Marine infantry officers, yeah. got assigned to the same battalion. Yeah. We're roommates down in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Yeah. Good times. Um, man, I don't know, bro. Like we're just, we're, we're on what we call the internal road trip, eternal road trip. It's never going to end. We've been to funerals together yeah. for friends, uh, graduations, you name it. But every time we have opportunity to come together, we do. And we, we dub this the, the, you know, the eternal road trip. Yeah. But, um, you know, for people like us, you know, you talk about how you want to give them a voice, yeah. um, especially if voice is not 
that are not getting heard. Yeah. And I kind of think back to that time me and you were in Lejeune. It was like 2014, I believe. Dark times. It was either 2014, 2015, yeah. right when, yeah. you know, Baltimore was happening, yeah. Yeah. Ferguson was happening, yeah. and we were sitting at my desk, right? Yeah. And when you're in this environment, right, we're not too many black infantry officers, just to be frankly honest. Yeah. And, you know, the office is talking. Yeah. Everybody's talking about Ferguson and yeah. what's going on. They should send the Marines in and the police and all this craziness. And me and you were sitting at my computer and, you know, uh, a higher rank officer comes in and he was just like, hey, uh, what do you two think about what's going on in Ferguson? And I just remember me and you kind of looked at each other. Yeah. And just based off of where we were at that space and that time, yeah. and just being officers in the military, um, you know, people, what we say matters, right? And I kind of think about a lot of those junior Marines around us and everybody watching us. And to be quite frankly honest, it just wasn't really the time and place to kind of, what could we really do yeah. at that moment? Yeah. And so me and you kind of looked at each other and we we're just like, sir, we really don't have much to say about it. But to be honest, like back at home, you know, all across the country, Black service members are having these conversations, they're talking about it, but one of the challenges is, you know, addressing these issues and really how we feel about it while being in the military. Of course. But I, I think us being civilians now, especially having a lot more experience, um, you know, history behind us, I, I like to tell people, you know, I feel like I found my voice these days, right? Um, I can articulate thoughts, feelings, and emotions in a way I couldn't back then that I'm able to do now. And I think that's one of the things that kind of led me here to Newark to stand up this Ironbound Boxing and give these kids an opportunity. Um, let's talk a little bit about impoverished communities, right? And elite okay. institutions. Yeah. Um, whenever I go to events, whatever, and I see people on social media, you know, people are always talking, right? Whether it's commenting on news articles mm -hmm. or posting articles on social media or yeah. going to events. But when it comes to action, yeah. how do we, how do people that come from these institutions have act and have create action you know mm -hmm. how do we because they, they're hungry basically people are hungry you of know course. we know what's going on of course you know it's hard to explain for people what it's like coming from some of these these black and brown communities yeah, in the inner city yeah, yeah. then going to these elite institutions and all mm -hmm. of a sudden it's like oh we're supposed to get forget about our people yeah like we're not forgetting about our families and yeah. our friends back home who yeah. aren't fortunate enough yeah but how do they get past the talking right yeah. how do we get past into action yeah so the first thing that i'm going to say is i'm not going to speak for uh, every minority at an Ivy League uh, graduate school, but I think that I've talked to a lot of my friends and I think I can articulate perhaps a few common themes. I think the first thing is that the first emotion that I feel is, is one of just being grateful. Um, grateful to middle school teachers, to high school teachers, to my blue and gold officer, to mentors in my life, to sponsors in my, in my life. I've had people who have taken the time uh, to, to train me, to mentor me, and that really shows in, in where I am in my life right now. So I'm grateful. Um, at the same time, I did work very, very hard to get to where I'm at. And I think the prevailing theme is that once people, usually of a minority background, get to school, it's not that they forget where they came from, but that now that they've ascended, if you will, they want to, they want to live their life. They want to get the brownstone in New York City. You know, they want to have the car and the watch and uh, there's nothing wrong with making money, um, but I think you have to remember that there are people who live at the bottom of the pyramid um, who look like us. And the majority of people at the bottom of the pyramid in America who are disenfranchised are going to be your people of color, your African Americans, your Latinx. That's who I, I really want to speak to. Um, and that's why my two passions are um, closing the racial wealth gap as well as just generational wealth and I think the way you do that is through financial literacy but I don't mean to get off, off topic no, that's now fine. but Go ahead. Uh, Share it. it's a free-flowing yeah interview. yeah I mean that's I think it's important right I you can read all these articles you can go to New York Times Boston Globe you can go to so many different uh, news publications and everyone says that the racial wealth gap between people of color and your, your, your white uh, Americans is growing at a rapid rate. Um, we, can, we can say redlining, we can say the jobs, the school systems, um, but essentially we're living in the roaring 20s. We're living in an area where the top 1% of Americans own more than I think like the bottom 20 something or, you know, not, not exact stats, but um, very few Americans contribute so much to the American economy and it's 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 not fair to be honest um, and there has to be ways that we address that like as a society um, 
my fear is that in 50 years, our grandkids are going to look back on us and say, wow, like they lived like this. They knew it was wrong. Um, and they're going to view us how we viewed people who uh, during like the civil rights movement and like why they didn't let African-Americans sit on buses, like how we view them with like disgust. I believe that's how our grandkids are going to view us with this racial wealth gap. Just going off of stuff you're talking about, yeah. how does it feel to know that like you're on path to being one of those elites? You get yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, of course. Like, you're coming from the same background. Yeah, yeah. You're going to the same educational institution. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And like that's your circle now. Yeah. To be honest, like that's going to be some of your tribe. Yeah, it is. Um, I would say I'm in multiple tribes. Uh, shout out to 15th Company, Naval Academy. <laughs> same, <laughs> I, company, same company, same <laughs> company. I represent different, different tribes. Um, being in a space that is normally not reserved for people of color is interesting, um, but I can only use what I've learned and try to help my community um, the best the best that I can, to be honest. And it's it's hard, man. It's it's something that's very very hard, and I don't fault people who want to live in the nice house in D.C. or in Atlanta in the suburbs. I, I don't fault them at all. Um, but aptly named for this podcast, my goal is as I climb, I need to lift others up. Someone who people I know, people who I don't know, they have, as they have climbed the corporate ladder, the Marine Corps ladder, the whatever, they have reached back, they have thrown a rope, they have lended a helping hand, and thus I believe I should do the same. Obviously, like I was blessed to go to the Naval Academy, yeah. um, but you know, you're at a higher level, just being quite frank right now. Um, do you feel like at these elite institutions mm -hmm. that that kind of spirit you're talking about, that spirit of give back, particularly for people of color, mm -hmm. is that getting nourished in some kind of way outside of like backroom conversations? Like, do you think if I'm trying to impact my community that those are the institutions I should be looking at, whether it's a Harvard, whether it's a Warden, yeah. or do you think it's going to kind of push me somewhere else? Uh, I'm going to quote uh, one of my old professors, Cornell West. Uh, I forget what we were talking about, but the, essentially the, the crux of the matter was someone in class was talking about how they wanted to uh, make a lot of money and they were going to help black, they were going to help black and brown kids by making a lot of money and giving back. And Dr. West said, that's incorrect. You're not going to do that. Once you reach that level, very few people are going to say, oh, now that I'm living in this million dollar home, let me now give 20% of my income post taxes to people of a... Uh, uh, disenfranchised community like that's you can say that that's what you're going to do but that's not going to happen whether it's the golden handcuffs or uh, there's some other terms to describe it um, there's a quote I forget who says it uh, but humans are very uh, seldom stronger than their environment so I think if you're the strongest person if you're put in a circle where everyone has the boat and the house and everything you're you're probably gonna follow follow suit and I think some as somebody that's like living in Newark, yeah. in a social enterprise, yeah, yeah. that's one thing I try to help people see, right? Yeah. Like if you don't start doing stuff now, even at a micro level, yeah. you're not gonna do it. Of course. When you hit. Of course. And I think a lot of times people like us, you know, that go to these places that come have the come up, yeah. you know, we get there and we're like, Well, I can't do anything like like I can right now. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I need to get that seat at the table first, yeah. become that VP, get some real money, yeah. then I give back. But if that's not in your DNA, yeah. if that's not who you are yeah. the entire time, yeah. you're not gonna do it once you get there. Yeah. And if you are gonna do it, it's gonna be so much harder. Yeah, it I I, I agree with that assumption. Um to go back to the original question, do I think that you should apply to these top schools? I think it just depends. I think it depends on what industry you want to go in, um, how people perceive you based on your resume. That I mean, that's a real thing, right? Um, you wear your Naval Academy ring, I wear my ring. These are things that we're done, that we're, we're proud of. And I think people feel the same way about uh, their MBA or their law degree or their MD degree. Um, people are proud of that. Um, so I'm never going to tell a person of color um, or like a veteran or a, any affinity group not to apply to top level schools. Um, I would just give them a word of caution that just don't forget where you came from. Um, Harvard will not make me. Uh, I am who I am. I'm going to be my father's son. Just like the Marine Corps did not make me, it could perhaps mold and, and change a few things, but like I, I am who I am. Yeah, I think one of the things I struggle with actually being on the ground here in Newark yeah. and just seeing the, the poverty, the violence. Yeah. I mean, we yeah. had two shootings this week, yeah. right? It was like Tuesday, you know, yeah. six people injured, yeah. one killed. That was one shooting. 
four people shot in another shooting, mm-hmm. and this was like the middle of the week. Yeah. And so, you know, when I look at people with potential, especially young kids yeah, that are coming out of this environment, yeah. that to be quite frankly are suffering from trauma at an early age yeah. that nobody's talking about. You know, we're yes. veterans, we're infantry officers, mm-hmm. you know, but when you talk about PTSD, real PTSD is found in the inner city. Yeah, it is. It um, is. And so knowing what a lot of these kids are dealing with, to send them off to places where it's gonna be hard for people to relate to them, where they might not have the support network. Yeah. And then once they get there, are they gonna remember places like Newark? Are they gonna go in and be that, that forgive me, that investment banker or whatever else? And consultant? Consultant <laughs> or something. And then it's just so hard to get them to give $10 to a nonprofit yeah, or yeah. come back and speak at this. Yeah. Um, so that's what I've kind of balanced with. So, you know, people on the outside looking in, they're like, yo, you should send this kid to the Naval Academy. You should send them to Harvard. You should send them to all these places. Yeah. But I kind of look at it, I'm like, okay. I also want that kid taken care of. I want them to feel supported. I don't want them to feel isolated, right? So I look at institutions a little bit differently now, and I'm saying, hey, where can I send this kid where he can get a good education, mm-hmm. where he can have that network yeah. um, and, and succeed? Yeah. Now, because of us at the Naval Academy, to be quite frankly, if you're a, a person of color and you want to go to Naval Academy, we have that network for them there. Yeah. yeah. But other institutions, not so much. Yeah. Um, so if I could give a quick shout out to my friend Malcolm, he's president of um, Harvard Business School's African American Student Union, and one of his platforms, um, he, he's one of the presidents, but his, his election platform was that we are going to reach back and we are going to help people of color in the local community because uh, if you go to Cambridge or you go to Boston, uh, it's such a, a wide uh, range of, of wealth disparity. You have you know, your investment manager, hedge fund, private equity person, and you have your person who's literally sleeping on a Harvard bench in the middle of Cambridge, and, there's, and it's trying to just buy like Chipotle, right? So like, there's such a wealth disparity that I think people who are privileged to go to a, such an elite institution have an obligation to reach back and help people no matter their you know, race, creed, socioeconomic status. So uh, shout out for Malcolm and the, uh, the staff of, of, of ASU for doing a good job and for planning local community events in the upcoming year. So this is a show about entrepreneurship. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and shift the focus now back to entrepreneurship. Yeah. And this is really where you tie in too. Yeah. So there was an article put out, I forgot, it was like a year ago or two years ago, yeah. that you know founders of color receive less than 1% of venture capital. Yeah. And one of the reasons behind that is we don't have founders of color yeah. on these boards Handing out these, handing out this money. Uh, I don't want to say handing it out, but you know, investing in these companies. Properly invested. Properly invested. <laughs> and a company well run by a CEO. <laughs> and this is a, for some people, this is a sensitive subject, right? But you know, and I kind of learned it from you. I won't say I learned it from you, mm-hmm. but I've seen you do it in action. And if you don't want to speak about it, that's fine. But yeah. I personally feel that we have an obligation to invest in founders of color, mm-hmm. right? Because given the fact that less than 1% of received venture capital, and just so you know, the majority of businesses out there aren't gonna get started on venture capital, but it, it, it brings to light a bigger issue of how do founders of color or people of color go out and start businesses when they don't have a friends and family around? Of course. Right? Yeah. When they don't have a network of angels, or they don't have people that can teach them to understand, hey, this is what you need to have in order to go out and raise and raise capital. Yeah. And then when people like yourself that go to Harvard, that go to these elite institutions, and they get around those networks, yeah. and they get connected with those people, if they're not going to invest in founders of color or people of color, you know, then who is? Yeah. I think it's hard to change that on the macro scale. I think just like voting or or other things, you have to change it on the individual level. Um, In my hometown, for instance, it's cheaper, it's faster, and it's more efficient to get certain things, really everything through an Amazon or through like an internet realtor, um, like kind of store and construct. Um, However, for certain items that I buy, I make a deliberate and conscious effort. I'm gonna pay an extra $4 to support my community, whether it's people of color, my community, my local uh, ecosystem, that is a deliberate choice. Um, on the, a macro scale, I think uh, someone told me that diversity is good risk management, diversity in thought, diversity in action. Uh, and I think, I think there's so much out there for people of color who are CEOs, entrepreneurs, they just have to go and they have to just since you just dive in these spaces, um, but that's something that we're, we're trying to do at Harvard. We have our annual um, 
business conference. Hopefully, they're going to be a speaker at uh, next year. Um, and it's good to see people in that ecosystem, whether it's Newark or DC or Chicago, meet other like-minded individuals and together um, be able to tap into capital um, that they previously could not have attained. So, you know, one of the reasons I started this platform, Lift As We Climb, yeah. was because as an entrepreneur in Newark, I've been super blessed to receive support from many of you out there, the veteran community, yeah. whether it's gear, yeah. shirt, uh, gear, uh, pro bono legal assistance, mm -hmm. um, financial assistance, you name it. I get all kind of love from the veteran community. Yeah. I have a free office here in Newark, thanks to the GI Go Fund. But I, I've noticed that founders of color, where they go to Rutgers, yeah. right, have to work twice as hard with twice as less support. Yeah. So you get entrepreneurs. I mean, we went and shot a, a po I shot a podcast today, yeah. you know, and the entrepreneur was telling us about you know, how hard it is out here, how there's no support. And I've, I've literally seen it. And if it wasn't being a veteran, mm -hmm. I don't know if I could do Ironbound Boxing to the level that we've been able to do it. Mm -hmm. And so that's like, I'm very conscious of that. So, you know, one of the things is, is you go to places like that and our other friends go to these different schools. How do we bring those networks together? Because guess what? Yeah. We do need people at the elite institutions, yeah. but how do you connect them to the small business owner that's looking to raise capital or just needs to grow their network? Because yeah. right now what's happening is we go off to school and we're all separated, mm -hmm. right? We don't live in the same neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. We don't conjugate in the same areas, mm -hmm. um, but we got to stay together. Mm -hmm. And how do we how do we do that? Yeah. So once again, not not being from a uh, you know, your VC or like your, your private equity background. Uh, I'm merely speculating here, but I know there's, there are things as like the, the Black uh, Economic Alliance, um, which is pretty involved at Harvard. There's a few other non-profit organizations. Um, I think it's just talking, it's networking, it's people are hungry out there and I think it's taking advantage of every opportunity, whether it's an affinities group, business conference, whether it's your, your undergrad, uh, your, your previous employer, um, you, you really have to tap into those networks. And I know this is a bad answer and I, we're not gonna solve a macro scale issue of, of racial wealth gap or other things in like a 30 minute podcast, but it, it's really just someone has to reach back and help other people. Um, I think is the only way for it to, smart, to start small and then from there grow and expand in size. Yeah, um, one thing I applaud about you and a lot of y'all probably don't notice, Pip, how many times have you visited Newark? Two dozen? Uh, yeah, he's been, he's been here a lot, right? Yeah. Um, before Ironbound, right? This He's been coming to Newark pre-Ironbound. Yeah. Before I even had a gym, just yeah. pushing tables and chairs out the way. I think yeah. you saw one of my practices. Yeah. Um, I think that's one piece of it, you know, making an active effort. Yeah. Because uh, until I moved to Newark, you know, everybody's like, why are you moving to Newark? Mm -hmm. But now that I'm in Newark, I get people like yourself, yeah. veterans that come visit Newark. Yeah. Um, and there's really no reason for them to do it until like I moved here, you know, they came to see me, but just coming back to this community. And I think it's cool how, when kids start to ask me about you, mm -hmm. hey, how's Pip doing? Where's he at now? He said Harvard, then they go home and they look up Harvard. Mm -hmm. And I think it's actually being seen and being visible, even if it's just a little bit, mm -hmm. not so much like, oh, I'm gonna go give this speech and then disappear for like a month or a year yeah. and then come back and tell the kid, hey, you guys can do this, but kind of having that presence. If it's a little bit of a consistent basis, mm -hmm. you know, of being seen and being visible, mm -hmm. and I applaud you for actually doing that. And you yeah. do live your creed. Yeah. And then going back to the other thing is, we went and got a haircut here at a local barbershop. Pip ticks the, tipped the guy extra. And he's like, yo, you got to support businesses in the local community. And I'd already been going down that pathway, but like, you know, Newark has a lot of nice stuff coming to it now, but if we want these things in our community, then we have an obligation yeah. to support those businesses I agree. with the dollars and keep the dollars in the community. Like yeah. you can get a Starbucks right there, mm -hmm. or you can go support the, the local coffee shop. I, I agree. And uh, you know, everyone's out there with their, you know, Twitter fingers and and we're, you know, we're, we're rallying against the man and against the machine and, you know, we're, we're, we're raging and we're doing all that. Um, but if people dedicate really two things, I, I think if you dedicate your, your money, right, literally put your money where your mouth is and your time, be a, be a person of action um, instead of just words and something that my parents taught me and something that um, I try to live, I, I mean, I try to live my creed every single day. Uh, I fail a lot, but, uh, but every single day I try to live my creed and whether it's community organizing or, you know, uh, a picketing or, or, or a rally, like you have to put your time and your money where your passion is. Because if not, it's just going to be you on the internet just typing about something, which can still get things done. But at the end of the day, civil rights, like boots on the ground is the only thing that's going to accomplish anything. Once you graduate Harvard, yeah. what, is your, what do you think your next steps are? Yeah. Uh, 
I'm, st I'm still looking at um, a broad range of opportunities. Um, my heart is in local city governance. Uh, I'm interested in how few, I, I believe that, that cities are the future of America. Um, everyone has, you know, federal government to save us, that mentality. But really, it's your local counties, it's your local cities that have a great deal of influence on your life. Um, and I would like to be involved in some capacity uh, in running my city. Uh, there are many ways I can do that. Uh, we'll see how everything kind of kind of lines up. But uh, as of now, the plan is to go back. I'm from Hampton Roads, Virginia, so really Newport News and, and Hampton, and, uh, and in some way help my city, help people who look like me, who are disenfranchised, who once again don't have that voice. Perhaps I could be a speaker for them. I love it, man. I love it. So for people who want to learn more about you or follow you, where yeah. can they find you at? Yeah, so I mean, LinkedIn is, I think, it's a, it's a great website. Just just Philip Jones. Uh, I'm, I'm not really the, the biggest on the Instagram or, or the Facebook, but LinkedIn, or if you send me an email on, on LinkedIn or a message, um, I will respond to every single person. Um, I do want to give a quick shout out to okay. Service to School. Um, it was an amazing organization. Um, it helps veterans whether you're an enlisted or an officer, um, it helps you get into these undergrad programs, these grad school programs, that you may think that you're not their ideal candidate. Um, actually, you are. You, you provide such a powerful voice in the classroom. Um, and also, I want to give a, a sub shout out to three of my service to school classmates. So, Timothy Bishop, who's at MIT Sloan and Harvard, uh, Nathan Jester, and Carl Mann, who are both at Harvard Law, um, both or all three of them are Pat Tillman scholars this year, so, all yeah. involved with service to school. So it's an amazing organization. It's an amazing network, uh, an amazing family. And I encourage all veterans to, to reach out to service to school. Uh, they can be your advocate and help you get into these amazing programs. Yeah. Well, man, I appreciate having you come on my show, come on the platform. Always. Man. Pip is always behind the scenes, right? So he's one of those guys I was telling you about, like, this is my tribe. Um, we when we started this whole ironbound boxing whatever it was like me you t pain at a table shout out to t pain at t pain's house in camp june north carolina yeah. like was it like 2014 yeah we didn't really know what it was you know i was doing like the fight and mojo thing but i kind of told people what i was up to of course um but you know from the entire time it's like you and t pain i'm constantly talking to y'all y'all are constantly giving me advice but like how does it feel to know you've been a part of this like movement that's not even i mean we're just getting warmed up i'll yeah. be quite honest yeah yeah um i mean obviously so uh i met you years ago um you are amazing now you're going to be doing something great and that's i want to be a part of that and uh i mean once again like as iron sharpens iron like you make me a better person and i think i help you as well and i think together that that's the point of the brotherhood whether it's the naval academy uh the marine corps you know one eight whatever it is uh I think it's brothers helping each other out is the best way to get things accomplished. So, you know you're my tight man now and forever. Eternal road trip, man. Appreciate having you on. <laughs> Yo, thank you all. Hope you guys are enjoying this content. Again, yeah. we're going to put out some unique content around entrepreneurship, but it's important to get guys like Pip on, guys yeah. like Marcus on, and some of my other network, just so uh, those of you out there can see, because at the end of the day, I see, just be quite frank, I see you making investment in companies in the future. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, nourishing that spirit now early on so people can see that like hey these are human people like maybe these are kind of guys i need to reach out to yeah. and i think you guys are going to pave the way for that yeah. so if you enjoy this content like i said before be sure to go on our website ironboundboxing.org yeah. you can uh, donate every donation we're looking for recurring monthly donations that allow us to fund the ironbound boxing academy yeah. which is our free boxing gym in newark and eventually support kids to train in boxing gyms all across the country yeah. entirely for free. We want to get these kids off the streets in the inner city and get them inside a boxing gym. Why? Because boxing changes lives. If they're not in the gym, if they're not in the, if they're not in the gym, chances are they're in the streets. Yeah. So if we can keep them in the gym, we can keep them training, we can develop them mentally and physically, then we can empower them to go out there and succeed outside, outside the ring. Yeah. And uh, we can't do this alone. We need your support. Like I said, those recurring monthly uh, donations. And then also we're looking for introductions into corporations with health and wellness uh, programs. So, you know, we offer on-site boxing as a form of an employee benefit. We're working with, you know, this last year with our, our client portfolio to WeWork, Spotify, uh, Next Jump, and looking to onboard some more clients and uh, have that as a platform to fund our free boxing program and fund uh, content like this. So thank you, love y'all. Until next time, keep Thanks, hustling. Guys. Feel free to reach out to us if you need anything. Peace. <laughs>